Hi, Wardy Moore here. Let's have a look at rule six, safe speed. What would you say is a safe speed? We have to stop and think. Most people would talk about speed that can st be stopped within uh, the situations. Perhaps they're saying, I don't know. Depends what the weather conditions are. But if it pushes you and then says, come on, what's the safe speed? The answer is in the rule. The rule says that every vessel should be, at all times be saved at a safe speed so that it can take proper and effective action to avoid collision and be stopped within the distance appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions. So normally, what does that mean? Well, in a river where I can't alter course, then I'm going to slow my speed down where I can be stopped. But in most cases, if we're looking for a coastal passage, then we're at manoeuvring speed. And that's a speed that is where we can take proper and effective action. If I've got space to alter course, then I can do. If I have to slow down, then I put my engines on manoeuvring revs to be able to allow me to slow down properly. When I'm deep sea, then I'm at full sea speed. Why? Well, full sea speed means that I can't slow down as easily, but I've got plenty of water around. So an alteration of course in plenty of time is going to take action. So then it talks about and the factors that we consider. So clearly I've got uh, for all vessels, my aid to memory are VD makes little Willis drip and Linda rubs salt in my vest. So all vessels need to identify whether visibility is reduced and so that must impact on the speed that she's traveling. If I'm on the coast or there is a high density of traffic, then the likelihood of taking action needs to be considered and I, and I need to be on action so I can take effective action. Larger vessels have less maneuverability, or it might be that you have some problem with your vessel at the moment. But turning circles, shallow water, all affect the maneuverability. The little refers to background lights. Now, there's lots of different situations here. When we go on the bridge at night, we have to get our eyes accustomed to night vision. And it takes sometimes up to about 15 minutes to reduce, adjust to that. So the brilliance that you've got on the radar or on the dials and reports and uh, alarms that you've got on the bridge affect that. So if you have that too light, then that's going to affect your background lights and scatter and your visibility to see. At the same time, it might be you're on a passenger ship and she has a large amount of safety lights that you have on for, and they may be obscuring your navigation lights. They shouldn't, but they may be. If you're working offshore, then working lights, high arc or high bright arc lights on the working deck could affect that. Either way, perhaps the most important one would be when you're paralleling the coast, it's difficult to be able to pick up small vessels on the coast side because of the shore side lighting. You hardly ever come into port faster than you would be leaving port. As you're coming into port, you've got all the port's lights. As you're coming out of port, then normally you have a blank horizon uh, deep sea. Weather and speed. It may be that you don't be able to identify vessels with bad weather. But what is important is that in bad weather, then the vessel may well be put under extreme stress. So heavy weather damage is a possibility that you would do. Unite orders normally say, if the vessel encourages heavy pitching and pounding, reduce speed, 
alter course, whatever. Drift is referring to draft in relation to the depth of water. And we're talking about squat here. So squat being the apparent reduction in underkill. Well, it's just not apparent reduction in underkill clearance. It's underkill clearance reduction. But it's an apparent increase in draft. I think rule six, this section really is quite important and it's that you need to have an understanding of it. When we look onto the other side, so this is for all vessels using operational radar. So now operational radar is the only method of looking and maintaining a lookout. So visibility here is a major aspect. The limitations and characteristics of the radar are in use the radar range in use. SALT refers to the sea state and the interference that might be, might be found. IN is for floating objects, ice, small vessels. MY is the number and location and movement of vessels at a distance. And the rest, a more exact assessment of visibility. Let's have a look at those just a bit more. So the main one I'm looking for really is this limitations and characteristics of the radar in use. There are many things that we can talk about here. Whether we're on X band or S band, is the radar set up properly? What's the age of the equipment or what's the quality of the equipment as in tonnage? What about the performance in the way of the magnetron? What about tuning, operator error, the knowledge and interpretation of the screen, shadows and blind sectors, ground or sea stabilised, relative or true motion. These are all situations where if you come to the bridge, then you need to be aware of these particular aspects. And if you are unfamiliar with them, if you're just taking over, then speed might well be taken into consideration. How would you tune a radar without a target? Interesting. How would you know that the magnetron is working effectively? These are oral questions that will be given to you or maybe given to you okay let's have a look at the characteristics and limitations so more interference this but what's sea clutter and what's rain clutter how would you explain sea clutter how would you explain explain rain clutter well, I've done a couple of diagrams. They're not very good. They're all by hand, and I'm sorry. But this represents the wave pattern that you're picking up as the radar picks it radiating out from the center. This first circle is this line here. And there is a lot of wave crests that are making over that particular benchmark. As I increase the sent or decrease the sensitivity and radiates out from the center, what effectively I'm doing is lifting the benchmark of those wave crests. So here I'm only picking a couple of wave crests up as it goes through. The problem is, is obviously that I might well lose a small vessel inside that short range. So C cluster radiates out from the center and decreases the sensitivity by lifting uh, and filtering out the high crests. Rain clutter on the other side. Here, look, here's, this represents the rain. Here's the target in the rain. This is the, the echo that's coming back to the vessel. So, Clearly, I'm not going to see anything inside there. But what happens is 
as I increase the rain clutter, I cut off the first nanoseconds of the returning echo. Well, that's fine. That allows me to look further into the rain and reduces the amount of rain. But at the same time, look at the target. See how that's been reduced, the area that could reflect and send back the target. If you increased rain clutter too much, then you would lose that particular target. So you would have to increase the gain at this particular section to emphasize this target. AIS is not affected by rain. If you had used your AIS, it would have told you that there was a target there. So for identification purposes, not anti-collision, it would be very, very useful. Okay. So the radar range in use, yeah. If you're on the three mile or the six mile, you're only three, three or six miles. If you're using off center, then off center would increase your range ahead of you, but it would reduce the range astern of you. And you need to be aware of that particular situation. If you've got this before you go into the NAEST uh, exam, then what happens, they ask you to offset, but then they also send fast ferries up overtaking you. And so sometimes you can only see them when they've got to three miles. Whereas by long range scanning, you should have been able to identify it. So using both radars, we need to be able to have long range scanning. Sea state and interference, well, the definition that you get from the S-band is that it's very broad and bulky. It emphasizes and blows up the target because of the wide band. Whereas the X-band is very fine and gives you fine definition. We've talked about the rain clutter and sea clutter. Small craft and ice may be detected by radar, may not be detected. So small leisure craft, yachts, small fishing smacks, growlers, occasional icebergs, because you don't get a very good uh, uh, echo from an iceberg, or floating pack ice, all produce very poor echoes. So if you're in that particular area, or might likely to be there, then you need to be able to reduce the speed and take that into consideration. Number, location and movement of vessels is because of the bandwidth is that it's only maybe half a degree and it expands to one degree, anything within the same. So if you're on a sort of 12 to 18 mile range and you see a large vessel there that's maybe looking like an island, in actual fact as you get a bit closer, it's the fishing fleet from hell. You're unable then at that particular time to use ARPA or to work out the true course and speed. More exact assessment of visibility. Oh, yeah, that was almost uh, a nautical term. All the other sections have talked about indicating and reducing speed when we see them. Visibility, amount of traffic. Here it's saying a more exact assessment of his religion. Does that mean that we can go faster if we can see? I think it's a false sense of security. Okay, modern radar, ARPA and AIS are all tools given to us to assess and identify targets. But the problem is, is that you can't... What can't you do? If you have a target, all you know is that you can see at that range in that direction. Unless you've got targets all the way around, you don't know what the risk, what the visibility is like all the way around. So it's almost a false sense of security. Hello. But what's what about the aura? How would you detect if there is a target if you didn't? Have any 
how would you detect a reduction in visibility if you didn't have a target? Hmm. Well, I've written down the bottom, the aura around the foremast light reflects out on the moist air. So clearly at night, if it's overcast and no horizon, and you start to see an aura around the foremast light, then definitely you are in restricted visibility. Okay, here we are. That ends it.